Evening YouTube, Atheist Chef here. Today I'm going to be doing a video about G... Uh, I'm kidding, it's about Once Forgiven, Now Free. Not G-Man. So just just sit down, Redline. Don't, don't X out yet, just stay back and watch. Anyways, uh, he has put out another video. I've, I've, you've seen me probably do a few videos, um, especially with the whole Bill Nye thing. He did a few videos about that, and I replied to that. But today he went after Non-Stamp Collector. Yeah, if you've never heard of Non-Stamp Collector, I suggest you go do that right now. Well, not now. Now, finish watching my video, then go listen, or go watch his videos. I'm going to link his channel down below. So, um, uh, the first minute of the video is him just basically talking about his name uh, and making off a pun about that. So, I've skipped that, and let's just see what he has to say. For example, he thought that the death of Judas was a contradiction because in Matthew, we read that he hung himself and it acts, we found out that he fell and his bowels gushed out. Did Judas die by hanging himself, or by falling over in a field and having his midsection burst open, spilling his guts everywhere? Yes, that's right. Correct. I just want to say that I love this video, and I'm going to link it down below because I think you guys should watch it if you haven't. It's fantastic when it comes to contradictions, and it puts it in a funny way. Uh, anyways, so let's move on. I pointed out that this wasn't a contradiction. Judas hung himself, and then his body later fell down and split open. Perhaps the rope or the branch of the tree broke due to the weight of the body, and he fell down and his bowel spilled out. Let's look at these two scriptures, shall we? Matthew 27, 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Very straightforward. He ha hanged himself. Uh, and then Acts chapter 1, verse 18 now this man obtained a field with a reward for his wickedness, and falling headlong, his body burst open, and all of his intestines gushed out. The first thing that I want to point out is this. Acts chapter 1, verse 18, says nothing about a rope. Nothing about a rope at all. Now, this is where... People like once forgiven now free and say well maybe he was hanging from a rope and then it broke and then then he you know he was on the edge of a cliff and so he landed some rocks and his in his in his guts gushed out however according to the Bible there's no mention of a rope and you'd think that somewhere they would talk about that but that's just one little bit, but let's go into the actual definitions of the words that they used, the Greek translations of the words that were used, and let's see if we can figure out if this is really a contradiction or not. Acts chapter 1 verse 18, the, the word, the scripture actually says, and falling headlong. Now, headlong is the word prenes, the Greek word prenes. Um, and of course, it didn't have much of a definition, but we know that according to uh, how it was written in Homer and a couple of other books, that word prenes generally just means um, with the head leading, as in, you know, coming forward, or without taking time to think about your action, just kind of rushing in there. Now, we mean by head leading, kind of like, oh, you know, say you're on a cliff and you're diving head first, that's your head leading into this. But people like Once Forgiven Now Free argue that. He was hanging off, you know, on a cliff, and there was a tree, and at the edge of the tree, you know, basically it snapped, and he came rushing down, and there were rocks below, and he busted his guts there. However, that's not the word that they use. They use the word, uh, again, headlong, uh, prenes. But there is a proper word for uh, anything similar to what they're arguing for, and that word is the word prospiptos, or piptos, to descend from a higher place to a lower to fall, to descend from an erect position to a prostrate position, to fall down, to fall into ruin like a building or a wall, to be prostrated, to fall prostrate, the dismemberment of a corpse by decay, which is kind of very close when you think about what some, and there's even some people that argue that in the heat of the day, his, cor his bowels opened up because uh, of the heat and he'd been trying for so long and then eventually it fell and, you know, something like that. Uh, and to fall from a state of uprightness. Now, those that word prospiptos is the closest representation of the Greek words to represent what they're arguing. And the word prenes, to fall forward or to go headlong, uh, according to the definitions of headlong, 
are the closest representation for somebody walking forward or running forward in a rush and just jumping off and committing suicide or diving headfirst, headlong, into the rocks below and my editing thing cut out, but I don't feel like re-recording. But the fact is this. According to the Greek definitions and the Greek words, it sounds more like just diving headlong, headfirst into a cliff than as opposed to him hanging himself and then his body collapsing and falling into the rocks below. Um, thing is, is you're leading your conclusion and trying to make the evidence fit. The Bible doesn't say anything about a rope in Matthew 27. Um, yeah, in Acts. Sorry. So you're just saying, well, Matthew is, says it and the Bible is obviously correct. So therefore, there had to be a rope. So let's come up with some explanation. You're completely unwilling to admit that it's possible that the author could be wrong, or maybe that the story didn't happen, that it could be metaphorical. When you're unwilling to admit that it could be wrong, you're going to just you're just going to make all these things up. And hell, I can make things up too. I can say that maybe uh, Judas was on top of the cliff, or on his new land, or whatever. And one of the disciples, or maybe somebody else that was really pissed off that he killed Jesus, and murdered him, and then put him on the end of a rope and made it look like he had hung himself. But we wouldn't know that, because the Bible is particularly vague. You don't have that right to just make stuff up, even if it sort of works. So, yes, um, it's still a contradiction, because... Acts 118 and Matthew 27 5 according to those Greek definitions are using are telling two different stories you are just taking what the Bible didn't say and saying well it could be this and therefore it works so it's still a contradiction but if that's not enough for you let's talk about something else Matthew 26 15 uh, Jesus asks what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you and so they counted out 30, three zero, three zero pieces of silver. Keep that number 30 in your head. Matthew 27, 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, which when he saw that he was condemned, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Now, right here in Matthew, he is saying that... Um, that, you know, like, oh, man, I can't believe what I've done. I've killed, you know, I've shed innocent blood. Here, take the money back, the 30 pieces of silver, just as in 2615, and take it back. But let's go to Acts 118 and see what it has to say. His response, then you make things up like Judas hanging himself in a field. Face it, you're making it up. But of course I'm making it up. You claim that there's a contradiction, and I'm showing you that the two are not mutually exclusive. It would only be a contradiction if it said that he hung himself, and then it said that he did not hang himself. That would be a contradiction. The mere fact that I can come up with a narrative that explains both of these passages shows that they are not a contradiction. A contradiction only occurs when a statement excludes the possibility of another. This is therefore not a contradiction by definition. Acts 118. Now this man obtained a field with the reward for his wickedness. So that 30 silver that he got in Matthew, apparently he bought a field. However, if we go back to Matthew, it says that he returned all 30 pieces of that silver. So how could he have bought the field? How could he have bought that field and, but, and still returned all of that silver? I want to see the apologetic acrobatics that you or anybody that believes that uh, to try and prove that this is not a contradiction. I want to see how you spin this. And see, you know, and, and maybe in some people that are uh, subscribers of mine that are liberal Christians that are like, they're sitting there listening to this and thinking, why is this such a big deal? So what? And I say exactly, and, I, and I, I really hope, I wish more liberal Christians would get involved with fundamentalists uh, and just saying, so what if an author was wrong? So what if two different authors were wrong about a story and they heard the, the, you know, the oral tradition and it was wrong or they made it up to fit their own needs or whatever? 
That doesn't matter. If you want to believe in God, fine. But don't, at least, you know, admit that you don't have to be 100% literalist with this. Quit trying so hard to make the contradictions not contradictions. Because you have to do a whole bunch of apologetic acrobatics, and you have to make up a whole lot of stuff, and you know, um, and then you have to take away from the direct literalism that you're trying to defend. You know, if you're saying that the Bible is, you know, literally true, then and then the Bible says one thing and it says another, you don't have that right to just try and fill in the gaps. Because if the Bible is literally true for one thing, it needs to be literally true all the time. But moving on. But moving on, the non-stamp collector recently posted this image. Before you ask me what standard of morality I'm using to judge the God of the Bible as immoral, please tell me what standard of morality you are using to judge him as moral. No circular arguments, please. So first of all, we can point out that he's essentially admitting that he has no real moral framework to make moral judgments from. Do I really need to go into the whole how throughout history as humans were evolving, we were developing morality, and that there's animals that we show signs of morality, and that not harming others, because you know you wouldn't want them to harm you, uh, you know, and help others because you'd want them to help you, etc., etc. That's not a moral framework, seriously. Which is true. If atheism were true, there would be no good and no evil. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. That's how Richard Dawkins put it. Oh, money! Take it out of context! Bullshit! Ooh, uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Ooh. Do you see what he did there? Richard Dawkins was trying to say that the universe does not have a consciousness or a mind, so it's not evil, nor is it good. It's indifferent. But he is trying to say that Richard Dawkins says that if atheism is true, that there is no good and there is no evil. That is not what he was trying to say, and it takes someone like Once Forgiven Now Free to lie about it to fit his needs. That means that atheists cannot claim that God is evil in any way, and they can't ever claim that religious people do evil things. Not if they want to be consistent. Not that that seems to stop them. We are arguing that morality is intersubjective. Any act that can be considered good or evil generally is agreed upon through most societies, if not all, that a certain act is going to be good or evil. Now, we do allow for the possibility that there may be a certain situation where an act that would de be deemed immoral could be seen as moral, vice versa as well. But we are very consistent, and it makes sense. We have been developing this for a long time. We've been around for a while and we've had a lot of experience with practicing morality and people practicing things that are immoral. We have every right and every reason to consider things good or evil. Next, the non-stamp collector wrongly assumes that Christians use a standard of morality to judge God. He's right. Christians are never going to judge God because they have a book that says that God is good. And we know that the Bible is true because God says so. And we know that's true because the Bible says so and so on, and so on. We don't. I don't put God on trial. In fact, if God had to adhere to a standard of morality outside of himself, then he wouldn't be God. That standard, which he would be accountable to, would be. God is good in his essence, and he is the standard of morality by which we can judge everything else. So when God found it objectively moral to kill people, kill the whole world for a purpose, and then turn around and tell people not to do that, which one are we supposed to listen to? When God commanded people to rape and pillage and kill children and kill old people and keep the, the, the young girls as their slaves, their sex slaves, which one are, are we supposed to do that as well? Is that how we're supposed to figure out what's moral by following God's commands or what, or what God has done himself? Next, the non-stamp collector notes, no circular arguments, please. Now, this is a bit of a philosophical point, but hear me out. Everyone believes things which are ultimately based on circular reasoning. In fact, everything that the non-stamp collector believes 
is based on some unprovable foundation which is ultimately circular. For any belief you may have, let's call it belief one, I can ask you why you believe it. And you could give me a reason or evidence, say, because of two. And I could ask you why you accept belief two. And you could say, well, because of belief three. And I could ask you why you accept belief three. And perhaps you could give me an answer. But your answers could not go on forever because you do not know an infinite number of things. Eventually, you would come down to your absolute standard, your most foundational beliefs about reality, which you take on faith and which you cannot ultimately prove. After all, if you could prove them, they would not be your most foundational beliefs. Whatever you use to prove them would be your foundational beliefs. This means that your most foundational beliefs about reality are ultimately circular. There is no way around this unless you know an infinite number of things, which you clearly don't. Being that this isn't the first time that Once Forgiven Now Free has lied to make a point or hidden information to make a point, I'm going to have to clarify a few things. Uh, first, what he's arguing here is about internalism, is basically that you know everything we try to justify, uh, you know, we have to justify internally, and we, we you know, when we ask why is this the case, well because of this, and why, be, why do we just, why is that, well because of this, and he's absolutely right. There, that is a uh, internalism eventually just leads to circular reasoning. It's period. We, they, that this this is way beyond my pay grade, but according you know in the the realm and field of epistemology. If you go with the internalistic route, you're going to end up circular, with a circular logic. But what he doesn't tell his Christian followers is that unless they're a presuppositionalist, their all of their reasoning is internalized as well. The only way to get around that, which is contrary to what he said, is you know he says that you have to have an infinite knowledge. It's not true. You can have external. You're going to be an externalism. Um, and you can have that now. The presuppositionalist out there, their externalism, they're a good example of Christian externalism, and there's, of course, examples of atheistic externalism. And I'm not really going to go there because that's, again, that's way over my pay grade. However, I'm going to link you over to Ozymandias Ramsey's the second channel, and I've gotten him a few times because he's really good with the whole presup argument and whatnot. And he is great to talk about externalism, and, and of course, you can Google that shit. But seriously, no, see, he, he, he's lying again to try and make atheists look bad, but really, you can be an atheist and an externalist, and you're not stuck in this infinite loop that he brags about. So, moving on. As I demonstrated earlier, you don't even understand the law of non-contradiction. But your problem isn't merely that your belief system is circular. After all, circular beliefs can still be true. The real problem is that your beliefs are inconsistent. Your worldview cannot account for immaterial, universal, unchanging moral laws. That's because the burden of proof is on you to show that there is immaterial, unchanging, universal law. Because we argue that moral morality has changed just slightly and has the possibility of change. And we can come up with reasons to think that something that we deem as um, immoral could possibly be the more moral act to do. For example, I'm going to go to my famous Law & Order SVU example. So you have a cop that's undercover and he's working in a prostitution ring sting. And at uh, one point, to prove that he is you know, not a cop, he has to rape a woman. He has to rape a woman um, to prove himself. Um, and the thing is, that can be seen as a moral thing for him to do so because maybe his raping won't be as bad because he's a cop and innocent. He doesn't really want to harm this lady. Um, and then by keeping up his acts, he was able to bring down a prostitution ring. Most people will go, oh, rape is always wrong. Well, in this case, it could be seen that it would be the moral thing to do. There's always, you know, examples into which Maybe certain things that may be deemed as moral or immoral may be moral. So you need to prove that it's unchanging and universal. Um, otherwise, yeah, of course we don't have to, we don't account for it because we haven't shown it exists. God is good. Because the Bible says so. And the Bible is true because God said so. God is true because the Bible said so. And when atheists accuse him of doing something immoral, they are being inconsistent and committing a circular argument. It's inconsistent because if atheists were right and there was no God, then there would be no good or evil. 
I've already shown why this argument is false because it comes from a an intentional misrepresentation of what Dawkins said to try to say that we think that there's no such thing as good or evil. But I wanted to say this. Good or evil can exist without a god. It can't exist without at least two or more people because without a second or third person, no one's going to be able to judge the morality of a claim. Only physical molecules clashing together randomly. We would just be chemical reactions reacting and you couldn't assign any moral qualities to any of it. As Richard Dawkins said, there is no good, no evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. This is Atheism 101. No, this is creationist, handcrafted, straw man of Atheism 101. As much as they try and deny the existence of moral values... I'm going to take a poll in the audience. I want you to raise your hand if you're an atheist and you deny the existence of moral values. Anybody? Anybody? Is that a... No, you're scratching the back of your head. What the fuck? How can you say that once forgiven, now free? You are intentionally misrepresenting us again. Why must you lie? They just can't help but do by nature things required by the law, thereby showing that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, just like the Bible says. You know, this, this verse, it, it reminds me of presuppositionalism. Basically, humans have evolved and you know done all the hard work and laid all the foundation for our morality and establishing what it is that you know, we deem as mor moral and not. And then Christians can come along and say, yeah, well, see, no, that's not true. God did it. And, you know, I don't believe that you came up with it. We came up with it. And you're just borrowing from our worldview. That's why it sounds like you're doing that. We were following the scripture. It's because you're taking facts and, you know, and evolution and science and things that can be proven and just saying, no, I don't think you should have that. I think my God should have that. Says, atheism cannot account for our moral experience of reality. And atheism can't account for the electrical magnetic fields that travel along electrical currents as my brain sends out signals to the rest of my body. Because I can't account for it, I guess it's not true. Christianity can because we have a God who is good as our foundation. Morals come from God, not from nothingness exploding and creating arbitrary rules which you then want to use to judge God by. That is absolutely irrational. That is atheism, and that is unbelievable. And that is another misrepresentation of the atheist argument about God, and just and throwing in, like, a shotgun effect of, you know, talking about the Big Bang and then calling it arbitrary rules when we're not talking about uh, prescriptive rules but descriptive rules. Uh, just, just everything that he could just throw out at once just to... You know, just because it can't, just all misrepresentations of the atheist position, uh, it's it's amazing. Um, I, I really just don't even feel like going there. This is like the sixth time that he's misrepresented something about atheism, and uh, I'm done. So, this is the Atheist Chef signing off. Peace. The Greek translations of the words that were used, and let's see if we can figure out if this is really a contradiction or not. Acts chapter 1 verse 18, the, the word, the scripture actually says, and falling headlong. Now, headlong is the word prenes, the Greek word prenes. Um, and of course, it didn't have much of a definition, but we know that according to uh, how it was written in Homer and a couple of other books, that word prenes generally just means um, with the head leading, as in, you know, going forward, or without taking time to think about your action, just kind of rushing in there. Now, we mean by head leading, kind of like... Oh, you know, say you're on a cliff and you're diving headfirst. Says nothing about a rope. Nothing about a rope at all. Now, this is where people, like Once Forgiven, Now Free, and say, well, maybe he was hanging from a rope and then it broke and then, then he, you know, he was on the edge of a cliff and so he landed some rocks and his, and his, and his guts gushed out. However, according to the Bible... There's no mention of a rope. And you'd think that somewhere they would talk about that. But 
that's just one little bit, but let's go into the actual definitions of the words that they use. Even in YouTube, Atheist Chef here. Today I'm going to be doing a video about G... Uh, I'm kidding, it's about Once Forgiven, Now Free. Not G, man. So just just sit down, Redline. Don't, don't X out yet, just stay back and watch. Anyways, uh, he has put out another video. I've, I've, you've seen me probably do a few videos, um, especially with the whole Bill Nye thing. He did a few videos about that, and I replied to that. But today he went after a non-stamp collector. Yeah, if you've never heard of non-stamp collector, I suggest you go do that right now. Well, not now. Now, finish watching my video, then go listen, or go watch his videos. I'm going to link his channel down below. So, um, uh, the first minute of the video is him just basically talking about his name. It opened. Perhaps the rope or the branch of the tree broke due to the weight of the body, and he fell down and his bowel spilled out. Let's look at these two scriptures, shall we? Matthew 27, 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Very straightforward. He hanged himself. Uh, and then Acts chapter 1, verse 18. Now this man obtained a field with a reward for his wickedness, and falling headlong, his body burst open, and all of his intestines gushed out. The first thing that I want to point out is this. Acts chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, and making off a pun about that, so I've skipped that, and let's just see what he has to say. For example, he thought that the death of Judas was a contradiction because in Matthew, we read that he hung himself and it acts, we found out that he fell and his bowels gushed out. Did Judas die by hanging himself or by falling over in a field and having his midsection burst open spilling his guts everywhere? Yes, that's right. Correct. I just want to say that I love this video and I'm going to link it down below because I think you guys should watch it if you haven't. It's fantastic when it comes to contradictions and it puts it in a funny way. Uh, anyways, so let's move on. I pointed out that this wasn't a contradiction. Judas hung himself, and then his body later fell down and split.